Hello from uh, Panachel, Guatemala. I uh, I am going to try something tonight. It's uh, about oh, it's almost six o'clock here on Friday evening, and uh, I thought I would just try to record this uh, this lecture outdoors since it's so beautiful outside. It's uh, presently about seventy five degrees, um, but I do want to just uh, just to say that if there are any unusual noises during this, that uh, it could be the chickens next door. It could be all the birds uh, flying around in the trees in the forest behind me. Uh, and of course, we can't rule out um, any noises being made by high school and college age students. So, but if something like that happens, we're just going to roll with it. Okay? So, we're going to, um, before we jump into the, uh, the uh, uh, appearance of the sacred, we're going, I just want to remind you about the aspects of the sacred as, uh, as mentioned in chapter two of the Cunningham and Kelsey text. And that's, the aspects of the sacred are something that's distinctive and set apart. Uh, it's partially uh, beyond the volitional control of human beings. It's uh, prominent with respect to human welfare and determinative of various aspects of human life, such as uh, family and marriage, rites of passage, uh, etc. And the book, uh, you know, starts with the definition um, of the in, with, in regards to the appearance of the sacred called. Hierophany, and a hierophany is the physical manifestation of the holy or sacred, how it presents itself, you know, how something, uh, you know, something we can maybe hear, see, feel, taste, or touch, uh, that would be hierophony, and that's different from another term called theophany. Now, theophany is not listed in the book, uh, but it certainly bears mentioning theophany is the visible manifestation of a deity. Uh, for example, uh, Jesus Christ, um, the Son of God, Son of Man, you know, appearing 2,000 years ago. That's an example of theophany. But for, the, um, for, for our purposes, we're going to stick with the, with the definition of uh, hierophony, uh, the physical manifestation of the holy or the sacred, uh, as we find in the, uh, in the Kelsey and Cunningham text. So they talk about uh, the media of the sacred, and they put that into four categories. Uh, sacred persons, sacred objects, and sacred time, and sacred space. Just here, you should, you should see the setup I have here. I have my iPod leaning on a, actually a coiled, barbed wire fence that kind of surrounds the area where we're staying, um, leaning up a cent, uh, up against a cinder block um, fence that my, my my hands resting on, and uh, I actually have uh, my notes. Um, resting on this barbed wire, coiled barbed wire um, fence that surrounds the property here. Uh, so anyway, I think I'm finished making my adjustments. So we'll go right into sacred persons. You know, sacred persons are, you know, in various religions, are uh, identified as sacred persons because of uh, what they have done uh, for that religion. The book talks about Moses as one example. Um, as a prophet of God, and prophet of God meaning at the very definition of someone who speaks for God. Uh, Moses claimed to speak for God, and in doing so, he uh, um, assisted in, in uh, setting the people free from Egypt. Uh, they, were, they were enslaved by the Egyptians um, after their 400 years in, uh, in Egypt. And God spoke to Moses, and uh, Moses began to speak for God. And uh, in, in, in Judaism... He is held in high regard as a, the, the prophet among prophets. And uh, Muhammad in the, in the uh, Islam, tradition of Islam, is, uh, is also regarded as a sacred person because of what he did as he, as he received the revelation from, uh, from the angel Gabriel, the, the, the very word of God, and uh, was commanded uh, indeed by Gabriel to, to write these words down. Um, becoming what, what Muslims know today as the Quran. Uh, both of those men among, among many, many more are regarded as sacred persons and uh, each and every religion has sacred persons um, as part of that religion. Sacred objects. You know, a sacred object could be something that looks very ordinary um, in, one, in one setting and then in another setting uh, is, is completely different. An example I just want to lift up is this book, um, the book that we're using for for our class, The Sacred Quest. You know, it's a great book. There's a lot of great information in it. 
But it's not a sacred text, even though it talks about religion. It's not considered by probably anyone to be a sacred text. But you take another book, and it could even be the same. It could even be paperback like this, uh, you know, kind of manufactured in the same way. But it's considered a sacred object. And you know, the Quran is is a, a wonderful example of that. A a book that the Muslims believe uh, is the very word of God. Uh, the Quran means God's speech or the speech of God. So that's uh, an example of, of an object that becomes a sacred object uh, because it is considered sacred by the adherents of that religion. Um, another, another example of that could be bread and juice. You go, to, you go to the grocery store and you pick up a loaf of bread and some uh, delicious Welch's grape juice. Now you are going to have a wonderful, a wonderful time with that you know both very very good items to buy but you go to a, a a Christian church and you attend a worship service that contains the the Lord's Supper or communion the Eucharist whatever it's called in the in that tradition and that those two ordinary objects become sacred objects during the course of the communion uh, communion service uh, just another example of something that could be ordinary anywhere else but in the context of of a, of a religious setting, it become it takes on the appearance of the sacred, sacred time. You know, many of us, uh, myself included, look at time in a linear fashion. Uh, many uh, uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims look at time, the sacred time, as linear, a definitive beginning and a definitive end. Uh, the first few words of of the Hebrew Scriptures start out like this: "In the beginning." God created the heavens and the earth, that, that there was a specific beginning, and uh, those sacred texts also point to a distinctive or definitive end, where even time will come to an end. And that's contrasted with the sacred time of the Eastern religions, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, that look at time as a cyclical, uh, in a cyclical way, uh, a, a constant cycle of, of uh, birth, death, and rebirth. Um, and eventually, if one attains enlightenment, um, that you can escape that cyclical cycle of sacred time. And then uh, finally, sacred space. You know, many of us, as we drive around a, um, our town or, or the St. Louis area in general, uh, especially a bigger area like St. Louis, it's not uncommon for us to drive around and, and see um, churches or mosques or synagogues or even even uh, Hindu temples, temples, and those are indeed uh, sacred spaces, uh, especially in the context of, of that uh, religion. And But have you ever considered that there are other areas that could be considered sacred space can take on the appearance of the sacred? Uh, an example that comes to mind is just last night as we were walking um, around the, the, uh, the small downtown area of uh, Panachel here. It's a, Panachel is a small town, about 12,000 people. But it's, uh, it has a, a very strong uh, Catholic presence. About 75% of the people in this, in this town are considered um, um, Catholic. And of course, we're kind of the holy season in the, in, in, in the Christian religion, and specifically in the Catholic tradition of the Christian religion. And as we were walking through town last night, now we had been walking, walking into town each night um, to visit the little shops, street vendors, things like that. And we were on a mission. We were on a mission for ice cream. And as we were finishing up our ice cream, walking, walking back up the street to uh, to hail a taxi cab, we saw something that just looked different. And actually, as we got closer, it started to smell different. Uh, there were there were people walking around with these buckets, like little black buckets, you know, with chains on them. They were holding by the chains, and they had they were. You could tell they were hot because they were had orange embers in them, but there were there was incense coming out of it, so you could smell the incense as you as you walked um, closer to this area. As you got closer, um, even closer, you could start hearing music like a, um, a mournful type music. And as you got right up on onto the to the crowd of people, and there were there were probably seven eight hundred people crowded in this real narrow street. You had the smell of the incense. As we were walking along, we saw little uh, miniature shrines that were set up uh, de depicting the Stations of the Cross. Um, they also had incense and candles, and then there were people 
walking around with candles. There were priests in their in their robes and their stoles, holding banners and candles, and and uh, leading leading their uh, the congregation in prayer. And in in that brief period of time, this ordinary space became sacred space. Um, as they carried the Adon, the Adon is like a, a, a float that um, is shouldered by about 15 to 20 men and women on each side. It's a very large float, um, no wheels, it's just carried on the shoulders, but it has an image um, depicting Jesus Christ uh, with the cross over his shoulder. And uh, later, after doing a little checking, found out uh, it's known as uh, De Procession de Jesus, and it happens um, a couple of times a week. Um, depending on what part of Guatemala you're at during this season. So in that instant, for that brief period of time, that ordinary street uh, took on the appearance of a sacred a sacred space uh, because of the, the, the music, the smells, the incense, the candles, and uh, certainly the people um, converted that space even just briefly to sacred space. And today, you walk by, you would have no idea, unless you were there last night, you would have no idea um, that that had become sacred space. So just to review, um, hierophany, the physical manifestation of the holy or sacred, and the media of the sacred, sacred persons, sacred objects, sacred time, and sacred space. Looking forward to being back in class soon. Uh, as promised, I do have coffee for class when I return on uh, the 31st. It'll be my first time in class. And uh, looking forward to seeing you all then and uh, continuing and having some great discussion um, in our class time together. Adios.